up, Rock Hills? Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Hey, that video is not only about precious kids, but it's also about why we do kids ministry. <laughs> so, so if you caught that a little bit, and uh, it's a partnership with parents, right? And uh, just teaching about Jesus, and uh, that's pretty awesome. And I'm excited today to kick off our Christmas series called Christmas Feels. So thanks for being here, everyone. I can't believe we are in December, but, but excited to be in this month. And I think it's going to be a helpful series as we look at many different things. Before I jump in, though, I want to welcome everybody that's watching online. Hope you're doing good. Whoever you are, wherever you are, thanks for tuning in. And if you're one of our soldiers, one of our servicemen and women, we love you so much. Hope you're doing well. Y'all, I, I, you probably know this, but if you don't, we live in a military community. We have all kinds of, of military families and soldiers, servicemen and women that attend our church. And some of them are deployed. Many are deployed right now, actually, in Poland, Lithuania, Korea, all kinds of different places. So if that's you and you're tuning in, we just want you to know, everyone that's here in person thinks that you watching and joining us is amazing. So thanks for doing that. In fact, everybody in person, would you give it up for those watching online? Hope you're doing good. And can't wait to have you back. Thanks for what, for what you do. And then for those of you that are in our video venue next door, hope you're doing well as well. Thanks for, for joining us. And uh, man, there's a lot happening. There's been a lot going on this fall. There's a lot happening in this month, in this, in this season. And uh, super excited about it. Next week is a, is a packed day. So next week, not only having baptisms, but you all are, are bringing those foster care gifts back. And uh, so thank you for taking tags. I heard that we only have 16 left on that tree out there. So my guess is today, right after this service, they're probably going to be gone. So thanks for being a part of that. If you took a tag, bring a bring gifts back, you know, so that's, that's helpful. Uh, or at least let us know so we can make sure that that student gets the gifts that they're hoping for. But what an opportunity that we have to make sure there are so many foster students having a good Christmas experience. And then, and then you know, honoring those that are fostering and then honoring the caseworkers as well by letting them, you know, distribute those gifts. So thank you guys for your generosity. What a great opportunity. I love, I love that we get to do this, be a part of this. So that's next week and baptisms next week. And then we have our special year in offering next week. So a lot going on next week. In fact, I thought it'd be worthwhile since we're at the beginning of the month to just kind of show what the holiday schedule is, or maybe you call it the holidays. Anyone seem like holidays or holidays and confused? Anybody? Anybody? And uh, so I want to let you know the schedule. So it's up there. And uh, so we got biggest thing is first Wednesday coming up. And then our, our services are normal times the next two Sundays. Christmas Day, our prayer is that you be able to enjoy Christmas Day. No services here with your friends and family. And, uh, and, and our dream teamers get a rest and get to hang out with family. We think that's going to be uh, a great thing, a good opportunity. And then the first, New Year's Day, January 1st, we'll have two services. Uh, just our first two, 9 and 1030. And then January the 8th. How many of you know this is going to go by real fast? It's going to go by real fast. So January the 8th, we'll be back to three services. And that's also the start of 21 days of prayer and fasting, which is a great time, a great opportunity that uh, many of you have been a part of coming up. So, so that's our holiday schedule. I want to keep that in front of you, and, uh, and, and we'll keep repeating that. Uh, but just a good time, fun time. And, uh, and so Christmas feels. Where did that come from? I want to talk a little bit about that this morning on where we came up with that idea. Um, uh, Christmas feels is all about this. Uh, many different folks have many different feels when it comes to the Christmas season. And you're probably aware of that. It, it, it's, you know, is, it, is it the most wonderful time of the year for some? I think so. Uh, like in my house, man, it, we're, you know, it used to be kind of when I was growing up, like you didn't celebrate Christmas till after Thanksgiving. I mean, one holiday at a time. But in my house, they start doing Christmas music before Thanksgiving. And that just confuses me. Anybody else out there like that? You're just, you're like, you know, when October's done, you start playing Christmas music and because you love, this is your season, this is your favorite season. I love Christmas personally. I'm a fan. I love Christmas. But I also realize that it's not always calm and bright. Sometimes it's crazy and dark when it comes to Christmas season. It can be chaotic. And many different people have many different kinds of feels when it comes to Christmas. And, and so it is full of joy. It is this Tis the season to be merry, uh, and at the same time, for some of us, it's a, it's a hard, challenging season. So we're going to do our best through this series to look at the original characters of Christmas over a couple thousand years ago and just talk about, let me tell you about them, the characters in Scripture, Joseph, Mary, 
the shepherds, the magi, King Herod, uh, Simeon, the Christmas story, a lot of different characters. Let me just tell you, they experienced real feels. They went through it. And they had intervention, and they had miracles and miraculous moments, but they also had chaos. They also had stress. They also had some dark times. And I don't know what that means to you, but for me, that means that I can relate. Because that means these characters in the original Christmas story weren't just some super biblical heroes out there that we can't relate to, but they went through brokenness in a broken world, but experienced the miracle of a Messiah. And so can we. And that's what we're going to be talking about in, in this series. And, and we're going to look at different characters, kind of scenes in the story as we look at the, the grand story, the greatest story ever told. We're going to look at some, some scenes that are going to have some challenge. But as we look at those scenes, I think we're going to be able to relate and, and be encouraged uh, uh, by it. And so, so I'm excited uh, about it. So um, the whole idea of Christmas, what is the idea of Christmas? You, you probably are aware. You know, part of the challenge a pastor has is to tell the same story every year, a story that you most likely already know, and do it with some sort of riveting excitement. As if you already know the end, but I'm going to do it in such a way where you're like, oh, I've never thought about that, you know? And so I'm going to do my best not to be riveting because you probably are already aware, like, Troy, you missed that boat. That, that boat's already sailed. And, uh, but I'm going to do my best just to talk about what does that mean for me? How do we take this Christmas story and make it personal? And I just want to let you know, no matter who you are or what's going on in your life, that's what Jesus wants for you today. Jesus wants you to not only hear this story, but he wants you to make it personal. And, and, and so um, I took uh, my kids, and maybe you've experienced this. I took our kids to Disney a few times. They love Disney, right? I got two girls, right? So, so little girls. And, and, uh, and so like elementary, young and then elementary age, we're getting right on that season where we're probably going to have to experience Disney one more time, and then Daddy will be happy that we'll be good to go. You know, so I think we got it in, okay, princesses, and we're pink. We're good, okay? And, uh, and so we went, though, and, 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 you know, as a dad, if you've had this experience, you know kind of how it goes. You spend thousands of dollars to invest, to take this trip. You go to the happiest place on earth, only to get in there, and your kids have a meltdown. Has anybody ever experienced that or seen that in Disney? Anyone, anyone? So you get it, and now that my kids are a little older, last time we went, you know, I don't laugh out loud in people's face. That'd be rude. But like internally, when I see that, I know that that family spent thousands of dollars to get in there. They all got the t-shirts on. They're wearing ears. The happiest place on earth. And the kids screaming, crying, and bawling. And I just think, oh, that's a scene of life. Isn't it true? And so we get into the Christmas season, and, and, and there's good feels. I was just talking with family about, hey, what do, what, do you, what do you love about Christmas? What do you remember the most? Man, I have great memories of getting my family together and and, uh, and just my, my mom's side of the family, the, my uncle, my grandpa, my uncles, both uncles, my mom, my grandpa, they would all sing together. And, and you know, as a kid, we were like, oh, why do we have to do this? Can't we go play, you know? But they would sing together and actually pretty good. And, and some of my favorite memories that my grandpa and grandma and my uncles, they've all passed away. My mom is the only one left with us in that, in that uh, family circle. And, and some of my favorite memories is just thinking back of, of, of Christmas time together as family. So a lot of joy, a lot of peace came with that. But at the same time, I know that many stories during Christmas have some chaos to it, so, some hard times. And, and, and so we're going to see stories in Scripture of characters that, that look back and they had nostalgic moments full of joy, peace, patience, divine interventions, surrounded by craziness. And, and, and so, so the whole idea of Christmas, to me, and also explains every single Christmas movie ever made, <laughs> right? When you have plans, and then your plans don't go like you planned, and then you have chaos. And that's every Christmas comedy movie ever made, right? So, so how many of you in your life, by a show of raising hands, how many of you have ever had something in your life where you had a good plan and the, and the things didn't work out like you had planned? Raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. We're going to relate with one another today because it looks like everybody out there. Now, now how many of you would say this? You, you would raise your hands and say, not only things not go as they planned, but, 
but uh, you think that most likely you're probably going to experience some sort of holidays and craziness and stress this Christmas, raise your hand. If you think there's some sort of stress, keep your hand up. Keep your, for those of you not raising your hand, look around, look around. You're the cause probably of their stress if you're not raising your hand. Like you might be the source as the friends and, and, and family there, all right? And, uh, and so here's the deal. This series and today and the character we're going to look at, Joseph, by the way. And, and honestly, Joseph's story is one of my favorites. And Joseph doesn't always get a lot of air time when it comes to Christmas. And I think that he should because he's one of my favorite characters in the story. But, but let me say that today in the whole series we're going to talk about is around this thought, this very thought of is, is the mood inside doesn't always match the mood outside. You know what I'm saying? The mood inside doesn't always match the mood outside. And the outside mood doesn't always have to match the mood inside. That's the idea of Christmas. That's the Christmas story. That's what we're going to look at uh, today. Now, I know this, that when you have good plans and then comes in a big problem, that equals stress. That can equal chaos. Some of your stories right now, today, in this setting, and the season that you're in, you would say, you know, I, I had good intentions. I, I have good plans, but things didn't work out like I had planned, and that equals stress, and, and you could relate. So what happens when our good plans experience giant problems? And that's the story we're going to look at with Joseph. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. God's purpose can show up even when good plans break down. And we're going to have to hold on to that truth as we go through the story. God's purpose can show up even when good plans break down. Joseph had a good plan. In fact, in his mind, I think he would say I, I, he had a great plan. He had a job. He was a carpenter, right? He, he found a good girl named Mary. They were, they were engaged within this culture. It's going to be important to know. In this culture, when you were engaged, you were legally wed, uh, betrothed. You were legally married, but there was another wedding that was like kind of the first, you were betrothed, you're legally married, but they also had a spiritual wedding, and, and, and it was in the spiritual wedding after the betrothal when they got married where they had sex in, after the second marriage. And by the way, did I mention we have an age-appropriate environment called Kids Rock, and that I would love for you to <laughs> introduce your kids to. They're going to love it in there. It's way more exciting than me, and, uh, and just throwing that out there, okay? And so... Um, so, so let's just be realistic. Joseph had a lot of good plans, but his plans got messed up. And what do you do when you've got good plans and good intentions, but they get messed up? Well, God's purpose can intervene. And so we're going to look at Matthew chapter 1 today, and we're going to look at the story of Joseph. And I'm excited to jump in. And, and as we go through this, I'm just going to challenge you. Um, honestly, if you're new today, maybe new to church, maybe, maybe you're exploring faith, you're new on the faith journey, uh, today might be really helpful to you because it'll be fresh in the sense of you're going to hear a story about, I thought Christmas was just oh, joy to the world, right? Well, it can be, but you can also have a different mood inside than the environment on the outside. And, and so if that's you, I, I'm kind of glad that you're here today. You're going to hear a story that may be helpful. And then for those of you that are familiar with Christmas, which probably is most of you, many of you, right? You've heard the story before. We have the greatest challenge you say, well, what's the greatest challenge? Familiarity can be an obstacle to the intimacy with Jesus. In other words, if you get too familiar with his story, you can be like, oh, heard that, been there, done that. What new story am I going to hear to make it more fresh this year? And I just want to challenge you. Ask the Holy Spirit maybe to speak to your heart as if you've never heard this before, <laughs> okay? And we'll go on that journey together. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. The writer Matthew, which I, I love to start with, by the way, Matthew was a tax collector. All culture, speaking of the mood inside, doesn't always match the mood outside. All of culture around Matthew in this culture thought there's no way a tax collector could ever know God, let alone be one of the disciples of the Messiah. So it's just important to note that it's that dude writing this story. So he's writing that through a lens that I think would be important to be aware of. And he says, so here, finally, 
And I think, and I don't know if this is true, this is just me. I think he said finally here on verse 18 because verse 1 through 17 is the genealogy of Jesus. I think he's like, finally, we're done with that. That's not really true because there's monumental power in the first 17 verses, even in the genealogy of Jesus. Because you read that and you're like, take a nap for a while, get to verse 18. But the truth is, here's what's powerful, that did you know that, that God's plan is to send his son through broken people, two broken people, four broken people. And I don't know where you're at today, but I just want you to know that God's heart for you is to send his son through broken people so that you can relate. Two broken people, which is all of us. Some of us are more aware of that than others. And he did that for us because he loves us. So he says, finally then, after talking about just the story of God's intervention... It's the story of the birth of Jesus, the anointed. Now, anointed is going to be important to even know what that word means. Why, why was Jesus anointed? And, 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 and here's what was really helpful to me when somebody explained it to me. Anointed means God's special power for God's special purpose. So as we read this story about Jesus and the Christmas story, so important to know that, that Jesus, the anointed one, means that he had God's special power to pull off God's special purpose. And here's what's beautiful about that. So can you. So can you. You can have God's special power for God's special purpose when you have faith in Jesus. So it says, Jesus the anointed, and, and Matthew realizes it is quite a remarkable story. Now, for those of us who have heard it so many times, we'd be like, ah, it's all right. But think about an audience that, that had never heard this before. Matthew says, this is quite a remarkable story. Well, why is that, Matthew? Because Mary was engaged, legally wedded already, but hadn't consummated the marriage. She was legally engaged to marry Joseph, son of David. They hadn't married yet, Matthew tells us. That's how we know that we're kind of in between two weddings. They hadn't married yet. And, and yet, sometime well before their wedding date, Mary learned, here it comes. I know you've heard it before, but let's pretend like we haven't. Mary learned that she was pregnant. Whoops-a-daisy. Gets better by all the Holy Spirit. Oh, okay, okay, by the Holy Spirit. Oh, Okay, between two weddings, legally married, betrothed. Joseph hadn't consummated the marriage in the second spiritual wedding yet. So in between that timeline, and whoops, the daisy Mary's pregnant, not by Joseph, but ha, the Holy Spirit. And see, you guys, you're like, yeah, we know, dude. We've heard this before. But it's so important to realize what a remarkable story. What, what chaos, what good plans did Joseph have that his plans just got completely messed up? Have you ever had plans in your life that got messed up really bad? Now, this may not be a big deal to us, but I'll tell you who this is a big deal to in the story. Joseph. Big deal to Joseph. Good guy. Good plans. Mary, what, what, what? Come again. You're not only pregnant. See, this is a couple things to Joseph. Number one, Mary's pregnant. And number two, Joseph would say, I'm not the daddy. And the daddy is who again? The Holy Spirit. So there were some problems introduced into this situation. He had a perfect plan. Big problem equals big stress. And here's what that tells us today, that sometimes our interruption can be God's intervention. Sometimes God's interruption in your life can be God's intervention. This was definitely an interruption in Joseph's life. And here's what's crazy. At this point, Joseph has not been given a heads up before he finds out. And here's some truth that I've experienced in my own journey with Jesus, and this would be some of the added chaos to the situation in Joseph's story, is often God doesn't give you a, a revelation before he gives you the information. And wouldn't you love to have the revelation before you get some information? Because you had plans. But plans that don't go like you thought can sometimes be a big interruption can cause stress. But God's interruption can often be an intervention. And I'm not going to ever say that God orchestrates every interruption in your life. Like, yeah, watch this one. This will be great. Troy thinks this is going to happen, but I'm just going to mess with him for fun. Some of you have that viewpoint of, of, of who God is. Um, I, I'll say this. Um, 
I've had some good plans and, and good um, intentions in my life, but I also am pretty good at making dumb decisions that messed up my own plans. Sometimes the decisions of other people mess up our plans, and that's super frustrating. Sometimes it's not your decisions or the decisions of others as much as it is just life in a broken world that messed up our plans, and we're not, things aren't going like we thought they ought to be going. And what's up with that? So I would never say God orchestrates all the interruptions in your life, but here's what I am confident in. God can always purpose them. God can always take any kind of interruption and bring about good to it if we would just let him. But in this story, this is God orchestrating this interruption as a divine intervention. Some of your stories I know, and in my story for sure, I can look back and, and, I, and I can see that, man, some of the biggest interruptions in my life as I look back were the greatest God interventions couldn't see him in the time. That's the challenge, right? When you're in it, it's hard to see the one day. In Scripture, the one day is when there's a culmination to all this brokenness, that Jesus is the Messiah. He does reign. He will come back. When you have that perspective, it, it can help make things make more sense. But when you're in the trench, it's hard to see the hope of one day when you're in it. Here's what's crazy about this. What, what, what in this story would you say is Joseph's biggest problem? Well, you might say, well, Mary being pregnant would be one. Um, I think that's a big problem <laughs> going on. Um, and that would be an interruption to his plans. But, but there's something even deeper. Great, uh, Joseph's greatest problem, now I'm not trying to do mental judo right here, right? And, uh, right? It's, it's just reality. Think about it. Joseph's biggest problem is Jesus. It's, yes, Mary being pregnant, but it's more than that. Joseph's biggest problem is Jesus. And here's what's crazy about this story of Christmas. Do you ever realize that Joseph's greatest problem is also his biggest solution? Wouldn't, wouldn't you like to be like Joseph's faith coach? Maybe you would, I don't know, but let's just pretend we would. If we're Joseph's faith coach and Joseph is like stressed out, why? Because put yourself in his circumstances in that culture. In that culture... Now, this isn't a prescription of the ideal culture. This is just the culture that God's speaking into. But in this culture, a man could divorce his wife for whatever he wants. She burned the toast. She's out, you know. Like, that was the culture. Not saying it was right. It was the culture that this story is written into. And if, if some, by law, if, if a woman had an affair, her husband could have her executed. And so Joseph is in a situation where he knows that is the culture. What is he going to do? He's not only facing potential shame, he's facing chaos, he's facing I had a plan, it was a good plan, and now it's all messed up. And by who messed it up? The Holy Spirit. And so God is intervening into this situation. And, and Joseph, man, he's in a place where he's struggling. What am I going to do? I, I don't understand. I'm so confused. And, and, and maybe you've been there. Maybe for you, it was a, maybe the, the, the revealing of information of a legal document. Others of you, you may say it, it was a report from the doctor. It, it was a look at my budget. Um, it's just a realization sometimes of, of I thought I would be here, but here's where, really where I'm at. Joseph is in the middle of chaos. And if we could be his faith coach, we'd say, dude, I know, I know this seems crazy. I know you're hurting. And I know you're afraid. I know you're confused. And you probably don't know what to do. But, but listen, Joseph, dude, what you think is your biggest problem, bro, is actually your greatest solution. You, you don't have anything to be worried about. If we had that perspective, we could speak to him. But the challenge is having that perspective when you're in it. Matthew 1, 19, it goes on, it says, Joseph, because he was kind, he was a good dude, good man, and he was upstanding and honorable, he wanted to spare Mary shame. He knows he, he, knows he can divorce her. He knows he can, he can, by law, have her judged. But he didn't wish to cause her more embarrassment than necessary. He's a good guy. So he's going to divorce her in quiet. Now, when Joseph had decided to act on his instincts, 
Here comes the revelation. He had gotten the information. Now here comes the revelation. A messenger of the Lord came to him in a dream. And here's what the messenger said. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to wed Mary and bring her into your home and family as your wife. She did not sneak off and sleep with someone else. Rather, she conceived the baby she now carries through the miraculous wonder working of the Holy Spirit. So, so important to know, like, that he didn't have this information and then make good decisions. He, he was just trying to, to be a good guy. He gets a revelation. And, and, and here's why I think, hey, let me just say this. Um, when you look at so many nativity scenes, even one up on a hill <laughs> on our property through this Christmas series, you know what you ought to do? You ought to give Joseph a big wink because he went through it. You just got to know, like, that dude went through it. So just give him a week because he's, give him a wink because he's a good old boy and, and he just needs your, your encouragement because, uh, because, man, he went through it. And so it's interesting to me that we're going to look at the story of Mary, too. And you can look at the story of the shepherds. And you know what's crazy about it? They got a, like a physical angel showed up in them to reveal the information. And Joseph just gets a dream. Now, many of you would be like, I'll take a dream. And when it comes to God's plan and purpose for my life, like, can God give me a dream? And, but in this story, they get a physical angel that shows up to tell them what they need to carry out as obedience. Joseph just gets a dream. And, and here's what's amazing to me about this story, and I think this gets overlooked. Well, for Joseph, I think, why did he just get a dream when everybody else in the characters around the Christmas story got a physical angel? I think it's because it's all he needed I think it was because he had such a heart to be obedient to what God wanted. God knew that's all he needed to carry out God's plan and purpose for his life. In other words, I think the power of the Christmas story when it comes to Joseph is just simple obedience to say, yes, God, whatever you want me to do. Think about the ripple effect of his obedience. So let's read in, in more in the story. Verse 21 says, she will have a son and you will name him Jesus, which means the Lord saves because this Jesus is the person who will save all of his people from sin. Years and years ago, Isaiah, the prophet of Israel, foretold the story of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, the Christmas story. A virgin will conceive and bear a son, and his name will be Emmanuel, which is a Hebrew name that means God with us. So the, in this dream, the angel tells Joseph, couple very significant things. The angel gives Joseph two purposes of who Jesus is, the purpose of naming him. There's a couple purposes within the name of Jesus. The first one is this, it explains it, that he is the Savior. But not only the Savior, he is God with us. Now that's so huge, so huge, so important for us today just to realize that yes, he is our Savior. That's what Jesus' name that God is telling Joseph to give. He's, Joseph has the opportunity to name Jesus. And his name is significant. His name means, literally means that he will save, but not just that. That also means that God is with us, Emmanuel. Here's what's awesome about that. God is God. I think God, if he really is who he says he is, has the ability to do whatever he wants to do. If he can create everything out of nothing, then can't God do anything and everything? So can't God just save us without having to be with us? I think he could have. And some of us, we still have that mindset of who God is. I would say it's an incorrect theology where God says, hey, y'all can't do this on your own. Um, but you're going to need to try. And so here's what we kind of think God did. God says, I'm, I'm going to throw you a rope. Grab it. You know, throws the rope out there. Grab it. And then if you grab it, can, can you work your way up on your good works and good attentions? And then if you can, and you work your way up to God on your good works and good attentions, when you get up there to around God, will it be good enough? And you just never know. You just never know until you get up there and then God will weigh the scales of your life and say, yes or no, nope, sorry. But, but just that if there is a God, that he would give an option to save his creation that is sinful and broken. He could have just said, grab the rope and good luck. Here's the beauty of Christmas. Jesus says, not just grab a rope. He says, here I am. Hold on to me. He saved us. 
but his heart is to be with us. He's Emmanuel. He not only wants to save us from our sins, thanks be to Jesus, but he also wants to dwell with us and in us because he doesn't just desire a transaction. He desires a relationship. And then during Christmas, you could respect little baby Jesus. You'd be like, little baby Jesus is so cute and nativity thing is a goosey boo-boo. It's so cute. You could tip your hat to the cool, nostalgic story of Christmas. Or you can bow your knee to a king. Because he's not only our savior, he's Emmanuel that's with us. So sometimes it's in our mess that God delivers a message. And we say that all the time here. And we'll always say it. Because it's my own personal story. Think about God's son, the savior, came crawled up in a cradle in mess. Where did he die? In the middle of mess, on a cross. And in the mess is where God gives us a greatest message. Verse 24, Joseph woke up from his dream, and he did exactly what the messenger had told him to do. He married Mary, and he brought her into his home as his wife though he did not consummate their marriage until after her son was born. This is just Matthew giving us a little context of the story to go, oh, you think that's cool? Well, let me add a little something else in there. I don't know if you caught it, but let me read it again. Matthew says, though he did not consummate their marriage until after the son was born. And when the baby was born, Joseph named him Jesus Savior. Now, I don't know if you caught it. Maybe you did, but there's a little statement in there. Um, If you're a dude, you probably caught it. (laughs) Along with great obedience is great patience. One of the things I love about Joseph is is he was not only a man who was immediately obedient, he was also God-honoring in the secret places of life. He was obedient to God so much that he was pure in his heart. When God's the only one watching, Do you love him enough, not out of fear, but just plain obedience to what he wants you to do, that you'll stay pure? Because there's a lot on the line. And whatever this story may mean to you today, you wouldn't be here if people didn't, in obedience, follow through with their purity. There's a huge ripple effect to Joseph just being God-honoring in his life. And then God gives him the opportunity to not only to name his son, but to declare something over him. And when the baby was born, Joseph named him Jesus, Savior. You see, in that Jewish culture, if a man names a baby, it means they legally adopted that baby. Isn't that beautiful? In the midst of chaos, in the midst of his good plans being interrupted, he realizes this is the divine intervention. This is an opportunity that he's been given by God. And this messes with my mind. But Joseph adopted the one who since has adopted all of us. And that's what God can do in any chaotic, dark, stressful, plans didn't work out story. If we would just let him have a divine intervention. And I'm going to wrap up with this thought today. Some of you need to declare the name of Jesus. He saves and he's with me over your life. Now we we could say, well, I'm going to name him Jesus, which is sweet and adorable. Or like Lion King, we can speak to situations and say, I declare Jesus. Right? This is Jesus. He's not just a baby. He's a king. And he's worthy to bow down and surrender to. And because he came to save and dwell with us, I can speak to every situation in the name of Jesus. Some of you need to declare over your marriage, Jesus saves. He's with me. Some of you need to declare over your health, Jesus saves. He's a healer. He's with me. Some of you need to declare over your faith, over your plans, over your intentions. Jesus saves. He's with me. Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. I thank you for every person that's 
here today listening to this story about a man who was just a normal man who had good intentions, had good plans, and they got way messed up. And God, then we come to find out that that you're the cause of the chaos in his plans. But Lord, we also now know that that interruption was a divine intervention. That his biggest problem became his greatest solution. And I thank you today, Jesus, that you sent us our greatest solution. And Jesus, I thank you that you didn't just throw a rope and say, I hope you grab it. Good luck working your way up to me. But you said, hold on to me. You came to us that we would be saved. But you came that we'd have a relationship and that you would dwell in us. So Lord, as we kind of start this Christmas series, the Christmas feels and so many different feels for so many different folks when it comes to Christmas time. Um, Lord, I just pray that you, you would do a work this month. You would deepen faiths. You would reconcile relationships. You would heal those who are hurting. And Lord, you would help us who know this story just to worship you like we've never heard it before. May it be fresh. And then, Father, I pray for those that might be here today who who maybe have wondered, is God real? And how do I know him? And I always thought that it was trying to be good enough. Maybe today uh, they want to invite you, Jesus, to be the Lord of their life. To just simply receive what you've already done for them. That you came to them. And you just tell them, just hold on to me in faith. Put your faith in me. The heads bowed and eyes closed if you're here today. and You've yet to make that decision to invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life. I, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I'm not going to embarrass you. And I'm not going to have you come up front. I'm just right there in your seat. What I'm going to do is just pray with you. I'm just going to invite you to pray. If, if you've said, you know what, I've, I've kind of been around God and the things of God I, I, I've known about him but I haven't known him personally man I pray today would be the day where you invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life more than a baby he's the one who saved us from our sins and he's the one that is with us and if that's you and you want to invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life I'm just going to invite you would you pray with me Father thank you so much for the story of sending your solution. The Christmas story is is evidence that we could not do it on our own. That you had to send us a solution and a savior. And then Jesus, thank you for entering our mess. Wow. The Messiah of all the universe came as a baby. Vulnerable. Dependent. Thank you, God, for your plan to rescue us and to save us. And if you want to invite Jesus into your heart right now, just pray this prayer. Jesus, I surrender my life. I don't, I don't just you know, tip my hat to respect you because you're a good teacher. But I bow my knee of my life because I want you to be the Lord of it. Thank you for dying for me. Not just being born, but dying for me. And And you would tell Jesus this, save me from my sins. Forgive me. Make me new. Change me, Jesus, from the inside out. Help me to go on a journey of giving my life to you. And and, and, and no matter the mood on the outside, Jesus, help me to have reality of peace and hope and joy on the inside of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.